Good morning and welcome to Worship with Our Savior Lutheran from Rochester, Minnesota. I am Pastor Ben Lavin. Our online worship this week is going to look very different from what we've been doing recently. That's because our in-house service today is a presentation of what our kids have been working on at our worship arts camp this past week. And with copyrights and licensing and all of that stuff, if we recorded it and put it out on our website, we'd probably be flagged and muted. So instead of going through all of that headache, today will be more of a meditation and discussion, continuing our theme from last week. If you didn't get a chance to hear my sermon from last week, or if you need a refresher, here's what I preached. And if you don't want to watch it, or you don't need to, please feel free to skip ahead. Our gospel story for today is from the gospel according to St. Matthew, the 13th chapter. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea. Such great crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat there, while the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables, saying, Listen, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seeds fell on the path, and the birds came and ate them up. Other seeds fell on rocky ground, where they did not have much soil. And they sprang up quickly, since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched. And since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and brought forth grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Let anyone with ears listen. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what is sown in the heart. This is what was sown on the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet such a person has no root, but endures only for a while. And when trouble or persecution arises on account of the word, that person immediately falls away. As for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the lure of wealth choke the word, and it yields nothing. But as for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another thirty. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Please be seated. As has been done with this parable many, many times before, we could spend the next ten or so minutes wondering about soil. We could wonder about the cares of the world that affect the thorny soil. We could be disappointed at the lack of understanding of the path soil. We could lament the troubles that rob the rocky soil of joy. But in the end, None of this actually matters if, and this is a big if, if there is no one to sow the seed. Think about it. If there's no sower, then it doesn't really matter what kind of soil you are. You can be good, rich, dark topsoil, 10 feet deep. But if there's no one sowing seeds, The sower is essential to this parable. But who is the sower? Well, Jesus is, of course, the most obvious answer, and he's the right answer. But he's not the only right answer. Remember, when Jesus got to the end of his life on earth, he gave his ministry to us. From the Gospel of Mark, go into all the world and proclaim the good news to the whole creation. From Matthew, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. From Luke, you are witnesses of these things. From John, you are to testify. Friends in Christ, we are the sower. We are called to proclaim the good news to the whole creation, sowing that seed of God's love with reckless abandon, as our kids demonstrated for us just a few minutes ago. 
To what purpose? To what end? To bear fruit and yields, in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another thirty. We are called to be sowers, to sow God's love, so that our community will grow. A community created, formed, and sustained by God's love. A community that witnesses to God's love. A community that reminds the whole creation of God's love. We don't need to save the world. Jesus already did that. We are called to be faithful to this role we have been given, however. Sowing the seed. Growing our community of faith. As we see in the parable, the world is made up of all different kinds of soil. Not everything we do will bear fruit. And different things will bear fruit for different people. Yet regardless of the outcome, we are called to be sowers. But what happens when we aren't? We are called to be sowers, but what happens when we don't? So, what happens when we don't live out this calling that God has given to us? Will God stop loving us? No. Will God abandon us? Also, no. Will God find another way to proclaim God's love to the whole creation? A way that doesn't involve us? A way that goes around us, a way that leaves us behind? That is a distinct possibility. God's done that in the past. I'd like us to take a moment and honestly consider this question. Have we, as individuals and as a congregation, been faithful to this calling? Have we sowed the seed of God's love with reckless abandon? Have we grown our community of faith? If we're honest with ourselves, we know that we haven't. At least, not like we know we should. We haven't been faithful to our calling. We haven't sowed the seed. We haven't grown our community. But that isn't the final chapter in our story. We believe in confession and forgiveness. We believe in new life. We believe in hope. So yes, we have failed to live out this calling. But guess what? God still loves us. God knows we're going to fail at times, sometimes spectacularly, but God still loves us. And even better than that, God gives us chance after chance to try again, to do better the next time, to pick up that seed bag once more and start yeeting with reckless abandon. So how do we do this? Well, like I've mentioned before, growing our community of faith isn't all that complicated. It starts with inviting our family and our friends to join us. It's sharing why this matters to us and why we believe it will matter to them. Because this community of faith, our Savior's Lutheran Church in Rochester, Minnesota, this community matters. It matters to you. It matters to me. It matters to the kids families and staff at Churchill and Hoover Elementary Schools. It matters to the patients, families, and care workers connected to the palliative care program of Iambi Lutheran Hospital in Tanzania. It matters. This congregation matters. This community of faith has more life to live, more good news to proclaim, more witness to offer. We've been a community for 75 years, and we can certainly be a community for another 75. 
We are good soil. So what's stopping us from sowing a seed? So, what is stopping us from sowing that seed? What is stopping us from growing our community of faith? It's not just our saviors here in Rochester that's experiencing this either. Loads of congregations are. But why? Why are so many congregations experiencing stagnation or even a decline in people connected to their communities? Well, there are so, so many factors to consider, and every congregation is unique in dealing with their own stuff and part of their own culture and all of that. But I wonder if there isn't one thing that we all share in common, one factor that we just take for granted and so we ignore its effects. We are all trying to do ministry stuff. Now, Pastor Ben, Pastor Ben, aren't we supposed to do things? Doesn't Jesus tell us to do things like care for the orphans, the widows, and the poor? Aren't we supposed to work on behalf of those who have been excluded, marginalized, abandoned? Aren't we supposed to help people? Sure, those are all good things, and there are plenty of biblical references telling us to do them. But we're forgetting one important detail. That's not what Jesus did first. First, before Jesus himself did any healings or exorcisms, before he walked on water or fed 5,000, before he raised the dead or was transfigured, first, Jesus formed a community. The first thing he did after returning from his testing in the wilderness was to gather his disciples. To be a Christian, to be a follower of Jesus, is not to be defined by the ministry work that we do. Rather, it is to be connected to Jesus and Jesus' community. After we're part of the community, with the support of the community, as a way of expressing our faith, then we do these acts of service and love. But first and foremost is being part of the community of faith, being part of the body of Christ. And I wonder if this isn't a major part of why our communities of faith are dwindling. We spend so much time and energy wondering about what we can do to serve our neighbors, and what we will be appealing enough to draw them to us. We've forgotten that we first have to include them in our community that we first have to value them as people rather than a mission, that we first have to be friends. And then we aren't doing ministry to them. We are doing ministry together as a community. So, as weird as it sounds, let's stop focusing on doing ministry. Instead, let's sow the seed and grow our community. And like I mentioned in my sermon, the way that we do this is first by inviting and including our family and friends, sharing with them why being part of this community of faith matters and why we believe it will matter to them. So, why does being part of a community of faith matter? What does being a member of this particular community of faith mean and matter? As you might guess, I have plenty of thoughts and feelings on this, but I'm more interested in what you think and feel. So please, share your comments, and like and share this video to bring others into this community conversation. Mm -hmm.